Lecture 5, Law and Reformation, the Authority of Scripture, according to Richard Hooker. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to thee, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly thine, utterly dedicated unto thee. Then use us, we pray thee, as thou wilt, and always to thy glory, and the welfare of thy people, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It seems to me that in our study of John Jewell this past week, we arrived at a satisfying place, which is to say Jewell displays all of the marks of the quintessential Anglican churchman and theologian. He has, on the one hand, a high estimation of the scriptures, giving the scriptures primacy over the life and doctrine of the church. But on the other hand, he is deeply learned in the Church Fathers. He exhibits a massive erudition in his knowledge of the patristic church. Moreover, and quite importantly, Jewell has an aversion to novelty, which causes him to seek to recover the tradition, drawing out of the dusty past, so to speak, gleaming treasures into the present. And in, in keeping with this, he has a a simple, elegant, and yet winsome apologetic tack in his argument with uh, contemporary Roman Catholics of the time. He says, we and the Church of England have not innovated. We are not guilty of novelty. Rather, we have recovered the ancient biblical faith of Christ's one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And I think it's this aversion to novelty that makes Jewel seem quintessentially Anglican. This is indeed what draws, I think, many people into Anglicanism as, as converts, so to speak. Uh, just think of the consumeristic bent of American Christianity that causes many worn-out pastors to anxiously feel as if they've got to ceaselessly innovate in order to ensure their own share in the market of American churchgoers. It's exhausting having to constantly reinvent the wheel. But what does Jules say? No, the task of the church, and therefore the task of the pastoral ministry, is not to ceaselessly reinvent the wheel, uh, to ceaselessly innovate. Rather, the task is to recover the past, to reorient ourselves to those ancient and unchanging and immovable bases of Christian belief and practice to, uh, as the great Reformation slogan had it, go back to the sources, ad fontes. A jewel displays this characteristic move of Anglicans back to the sources quite well. Now, I wonder if it occurred to any of you that though this is attractive, it's not a wholly sufficient approach to the task of the church in every age. Why do I say this? I say this because the church uh, is a reality that moves through time. The church is uh, an institution that moves through changing historical and cultural circumstances, which means, though it is important to go back to the sources, we can't simply be content in the church with a mere restatement of ancient truths and a mere reassertion of ancient practices because the church not only looks back in time, but it also must move forward through time into the future, facing constantly shifting cultural circumstances. Therefore, simply recovering what the church has done in a previous age does not fully answer what the church is to do in this age. Because the church must move through time. And so the, the task of the church is far more complicated than we might think if we only read John Jewell. The task of the church is indeed more difficult. The church must, so to speak, faithfully render unchanging biblical truths, but in the constantly changing cultural idioms of its day. The church, in other words, despite Jewell's negative bias toward novelty, the church must innovate. And think even of the witness of scripture itself. 
the witness of Scripture is given to us already within a cultural context that is not our own, which means we need to do the task of, so to speak, getting the timeless message of Scripture uh, without also importing uh, a culture that is not necessarily authoritative over us. And this is the task of biblical exegesis. Uh, we need to recognize Furthermore, how the unchanging message of Scripture and how the firm bases of ancient Christian belief and practice are brought to bear on our different cultural circumstances in our own day. So the church then, to summarize this thought, the church must discern how Scripture is ordering its life today rather than simply duplicate how the Word of God ordered the life of the church in another age. On the other hand, the church must do this difficult task of discernment without destroying its own foundation. For indeed, the church destroys its own foundation when it rejects the faith once delivered to the saints. So without changing what cannot and must not be changed, the substance of the faith, uh, the church must constantly adapt and be flexible in the midst of changing circumstances, which means we need some other measure for how to live faithfully than simply the negative command of do not innovate. To a certain extent, the church must innovate, but it can either do this faithfully or unfaithfully. To innovate faithfully would, it not, would be to not change the substance of the faith, uh, to innovate unfaithfully would be to change the substance of the faith, but how do we know how to draw the line between faithful innovation and unfaithful innovation? Uh, what falls in the prerogative of the church to change and adapt, uh, and what does not? We need some sort of measure in order to discern. And this brings us to the great figure of Richard Hooker. Uh, which we are studying this week. He's indeed a massive, towering figure for Anglican theology, which is why we're spending two weeks on uh, Hooker's theology, trying to understand it in detail in its own historical context. Now, I realize we've already dipped into Hooker a bit. We have read sections of his learned discourse of justification, uh, in which we saw Hooker raised adoption in Christ to the place of primacy in our salvation. Uh, furthermore, we've looked briefly at his Eucharistic theology in, as he develops it in Book 5 of his The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, where we saw him tying together some of those loose ends left by Cranmer's understanding of the Eucharist. Well, uh, I think Hooker merits a closer look, which is why we're now spending two more weeks upon him, just studying his theology without looking at others. Uh, Hooker merits this. So next week, we'll be looking at, a little bit more closely, Hooker's doctrine of salvation as he develops it in Book 5 of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. And what we'll see is that he displays a magnificent vision of salvation in Christ, weaving together Trinitarian theology and Christology in a remarkable and beautiful uh, vision of salvation. In short, what Hooker wants to say to us is that salvation is nothing less than the triune God drawing us into his own life through the work of Jesus Christ in the flesh. So I hope that next week we'll find our hearts strangely warmed as we look into this uh, very contemplative theology of Hooker's uh, uh, doctrine of salvation. This week, however, we are going to look at Hooker's involvement in the controversies of his day. You'll recall from last week that John Jewell was the great defender of the Church of England against Catholic objections. A generation after Jewell, still in the Elizabethan church, for Elizabeth had a, a, a very long reign, um, Jewell was working in the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, uh, Hooker was working in the end of Elizabeth's reign, um, whereas Jewell was the defender of the Church of England against Catholic objections, Hooker is the defender of the Church of England against radical Puritan objections. You'll recall that Jewell defended the Church of England against the Catholic objection that 
the Church of England had changed the ancient and biblical faith of the church. That the Church of England was guilty of the crime of novelty. And Hooker's response was, of course, we have not innovated, we have recovered the ancient faith. What the Puritans said is, oh, no, you have not recovered that ancient faith. In fact, you have only half recovered the ancient faith, but you still have many of the marks of Catholic innovations. You have not gone sufficiently back to the sources because you are not a fully biblical church. Uh, in other words, the, the Church of England in Jewel said, we have not innovated. And the Puritans said, uh, in effect, oh, but you have. Look at the life of your church. You have vestments. Uh, you have a written liturgy. Uh, you do the sign of cross in baptism. Uh, you do not sufficiently uh, keep the Sabbath. You have bishops. All of these things are in violation of the clear command of Scripture, and insofar as you uh, carry out these various actions in the life of your church, you are still innovating, and you still haven't gone back to the sources, and you haven't recovered a fully biblical faith. It will be Hooker who responds to this new objection to the Church of England, and in responding to this, he has to give an different answer than Jewell gave in his defense of the Church of England. Uh, more particularly, what Hooker has to make clear is that novelty in every case is not necessarily contrary to uh, the church's mission uh, and the task of uh, the church Catholic in every age. It's not merely to preserve, it's also the responsibility of the church to move forward in time in ways that are both faithful and flexible. Responding to new situations in a way that is in tune with uh, the ancient bases of Christian belief and practice. Well, if you look at your notes, you'll see a section uh, entitled, What Kind of a Theologian Was Richard Hooker? Um, I'm going to save this for next week uh, simply because uh, this lecture may be a little bit longer than I would like and next week's lecture might be a little bit shorter. And so I think it makes sense to save that for next week. Which brings us to the historical background for Richard Hooker's apology of the Church of England or his defense of the Church of England against radical Puritan critiques. Let's look at this together. As I mentioned earlier, Jewell is writing a generation, excuse me, Hooker is writing a generation after Jewell. Uh, there was actually a relationship between Jewell and Hooker. Uh, for John Jewell, the Bishop of Salisbury, was Hooker's patron for a while as he uh, uh, began and finished his studies. Uh, but whereas Jewell was defending the Church of England against Catholic objections, here we see Hooker defending the Elizabethan Church against radical Puritan critiques. These radical Puritans thought that the English church was but half reformed. And they vocally wished that the church would go a good deal further in cleansing the Church of England from Romish thoughts and practices and create a church that is more strictly biblical. We'll have to talk about what they mean. Now, I do insist on distinguishing between the radical Puritans that Richard Hooker has in his crosshairs and the more moderate Puritans that were there in the time of England, uh, at that time in the Church of England, rather. Um, we must distinguish between these two. Um, there is a long history of Puritanism in the Anglican tradition that comes up even to the present day. One could consider, could consider a theologian like J.I. Packer as being an Anglican in a Puritan tradition, an Anglican of a Puritan uh, stamp. But what we're talking about in Hooker's apology or his defense of the Church of England is uh, a radical Puritan strain that pressed uh, much more stridently uh, and much more thoroughly for a strictly biblical church as they understood that. The Puritan urge was really born under Henry and uh, Edward in the earlier uh, 
uh, time of the Church of England's departure from Rome, uh, for there were always Protestants within the Church of England that were pressing uh, for more and more reforms of the vestiges of a Roman Catholic past within the Church of England. There were many of those uh, in Henry's reign, those vestiges of a Catholic past, uh, and still some in the reign of Edward, uh, despite uh, the seemingly thorough uh, job of reform carried out by uh, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. But more crucially, Puritanism was incubated in Marian exile. What happens with the, the ascent of Mary to the throne is the, the nation of England is brought into, once again, Catholic obedience to the See of Rome, uh, which caused the necessity of many Protestants uh, to flee to the continent uh, as exiles, and they found themselves in places like Geneva, where the Calvinist Re Reformation was underway, or places uh, like Zurich, where likewise the Reformation was underway, and they, for that time of Mary's reign, while they're in exile, they observed and participated in the life of those Reformed churches. Upon their return to England under Elizabeth, who once again restores uh, the Reforms uh, that uh, were done under the time of Edward, uh, they greatly wished the Church of England to reform itself in step with the churches they observed on the continent. Uh, it's, it's not unlike when parishioners go on vacation uh, in the summertime and they come back at the end of the summer talking about all the wonderful things the church they visited uh, in Miami or wherever was doing. And, you know, as a, as a, a rector, you just have to nod your head and say, well, th those sound like very good ways of doing it. Um, well, a much more serious situation is these radical Puritans, having observed, let's say, the Church of Geneva uh, with the Calvinist Reformation, and considered that to be a thoroughly biblical reformation. And then they see the Church of England, which uh, has still many vestiges of Catholicism in it, and their assessment was, this is not a fully reformed church. It needs to be more reformed along the lines of the Church of Geneva if it is going to be a fully biblical church. What's at stake here is nothing less than obedience to the Bible. And so the radical Puritans made these demands on the Church of England that it make itself a more thoroughly scriptural church. The radical Puritans rejected many of the practices that were then accepted in the Church of England. Uh, liturgical vestments such as the surplus, uh, church ornaments uh, uh, adorning the church, and decorating it, the sign of the cross in baptism, the celebration of feast days, uh, the functioning of ecclesiastical courts that would hold trials, uh, as well as Episcopal governance, that is to say, uh, governance of the church by bishops. All of these uh, seem to these radical Puritans that witnessed the remarkable reformation in the Church of Geneva, let's say, uh, all of these seem to be holdovers or leftovers from uh, the superstitions of a Catholic past. Furthermore, the Puritans emphasized to a far greater extent than the Church of England such things as Sunday Sabbath observance, tables rather than altars, uh, as well as the preaching of Holy Scripture, more than just the reading of Holy Scripture, which was often the practice uh, week by week in many churches in the nation of England. For the scriptures would always be read, but a sermon wouldn't always be given. Uh, to the, the Puritans, again, these are all signs that the Church of England is but half reformed. It's gone part of the way in recovering the ancient faith, but it hasn't gone all the way. It is still out of step with the, a fully biblical vision with, for what the church should be. There were two interlocking concerns for the radical Puritans. First, uh, precisionism. This is a term I get from Bradford Littlejohn in his very fine book on Richard Hooker. Uh, precisionism is seeking precise guidance in the word of God for every area of life, but especially for ecclesiastical matters. So precisionism is looking for precise guidance in Scripture for every area of life. 
Now, the earlier reformers, uh, whether in England or elsewhere, uh, considered the scriptures to contain all things necessary for salvation. But notice how this precisionism of the radical Puritans goes beyond that. The Bible doesn't merely contain all things necessary for salvation, but all things simply. Whatever area of life we are concerned with, the scripture is uh, our very guide, uh, giving us uh, clear guidance and explicit commands for everything that we might uh, uh, think or do or deliberate upon. Uh, there's one Puritan who said, we need the guidance of scripture and the command of the word of God for even the seemingly ins insignificant action of picking up a straw from the ground. So even the picking up of a piece of straw, uh, if you are going to do that in faith and obedience, you need to do that action uh, under uh, in obedience to the command of Scripture. Do you see then how uh, very uh, stringent uh, this demand for a more biblical faith must then be? Uh, the typical proof text for the radical Puritans would be Romans 14.23, uh, in which Paul says, All that is not of faith is sin. All that is not of faith is sin. Now, faith is what lays hold of the uh, word of God in Holy Scripture. Therefore, if we are not for our actions responding to the command of the word of God, then that is sin. For everything that is not of faith is sin. Which means, which means that we, this means that we need the precise and clear guidance of Holy Scripture for everything. Uh, even the least action is either obedient or disobedient to the Word of God. What what Hooker will recognize, as well as others, is this undermines the distinction between matters of primary importance and matters of secondary importance. If everything is to be done in obedience to the word of God alone, then that means there is no longer uh, any matter that is indifferent in nature. There's no such thing as um, adiaphora, let's say because everything is a matter of obedience or disobedience to God's word. Everything is a matter of faith, or it is indeed sin. So what this does, this precisionism, is it expands greatly the scope of sola scriptura. All of the reformers held to sola scriptura, but prior to the radical Puritans, what they meant by sola scriptura, or scripture alone, is that scripture alone contains all things necessary for salvation. So you can't require anyone to believe in something for salvation that is not found in uh, clearly uh, in Holy Scripture. But they did, the earlier reformers did not mean that Scripture contains all things necessary for life, period. Uh, but that is precisely what these radical Puritans are saying. Scripture contains all things simply. The second concern of the radical Puritans that interlocks with the first one is Presbyterianism. Uh, this is uh, a, a particular take on church polity that, that says there must be no standing inequality among uh, ordained ministers. And each minister in a church that is ordained must have a team of lay elders or lay pastors that are drawn from the membership uh, in order to assist in church discipline and governance. So really what, what Presbyterians and the radical Puritans... Oh, these automatic lights, sorry, hang on just a second. There we go, I think that's a sign I'm talking too much. Um, I apologize, where was I? Ah yes, I was talking about Presbyterianism. The, the fear for Presbyterians, um, especially for these radical Puritans who are demanding Presbyterianism as a matter of you know, biblical obedience, uh, the concern was uh, the episcopate elevates one man over the church, which then uh, seems to threaten the sole headship of Christ over the church. Um, and so they said there must be no standing inequality, no permanent inequality among ministers. Uh, if you are ordained, you are, you are in a company of equals. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the 
the very notion of episcopacy says that there are um, there are bishops, priests, and deacons, each in uh, various ranks within the church's governance. So there is a standing inequality between the authority of a bishop and the authority of a presbyter or a priest and the authority of a deacon. Um, this is uh, a concern for the Presbyterians because they think standing inequality between ministers is a relic of a popish past. Because this is precisely what the Pope of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, has claimed for himself. Supremacy over uh, the other bishops and priests uh, and the laity within the church as a permanent aspect uh, of his authoritative office. Moreover, in keeping with the first point of precisionism, the radical Puritans considered a Presbyterian polity not to be merely a good way to do things, but the only biblical way of doing things. They considered the, New Te the explicit teaching of the New Testament to be one of a Presbyterian polity. So if a church had a different polity than Presbyterianism, then that church uh, is in a state of disobedience to the word of God and, of course, all that is not of faith is sin. Faith is always a matter of obedience to what God has said. Therefore, the Church of England is in a state of sin rather than faith. Uh, by holding to an Episcopal polity that departs from the sole biblical standard of Presbyterianism. So you see how precisionism, looking for precise guidance in every area of life, and Presbyterianism, which was claimed to be the, uh, the teaching of Holy Scripture regarding the church's polity, interlock into a single objection to the Church of England. The Church of England is but half reformed. Uh, it is not a fully biblical church. Therefore, the Church of England is in disobedience to the word of God and thus a state of sin, which is a very serious objection. What the Church of England needs to do, according to the radical Puritans, is to purify itself along strictly biblical lines, looking for every aspect of its life uh, uh, to conform that aspe every aspect of its life to uh, the commands of the Word of God. It is Richard Hooker who responds to this uh, objection to the Church of England's uh, life, doctrine, and practice and begins making distinctions uh, that will uh, alter that simple attitude of jewel toward novelty. In a nutshell, what Hooker will argue is that there are areas of the church's life that can be altered, uh, where we can innovate, where we can devise new ways of doing things so long as it's for the edification of the church, and there are other way areas of the church's life, such as doctrine, where the church is not free to innovate. So what Hooker says is we need some distinctions, uh, but I'll get to that in the next section of the lecture.